Hi guys, I am Elon Gore, Professor of Zoology. So I would like to continue genetics further more. So last class we said something about the inheritance of sex linked characters and how far the characters normally have been transmitted from one generation to another. So here let's see some more characters related to the disorders caused by some sort of problems in the genetic material. So we have a number of disorders. Almost all disorders are due to inborn error of metabolism. So in the body we have a number of metabolic pathways. A metabolic pathway or biochemical pathway involves a stepwise conversion of one substance into another. So that we have received the final product. And each step is catalyzed by a particular enzyme. So an example. Suppose you are taking a substrate 1. It's being converted into substrate 2, then substrate 3, substrate 4. Maybe this is the raw material or so S1. And S4 actually the final product. The final product. And these are all the intermediate products, S2, S3. And each step in a biosynthetic pathway or metabolic pathway is controlled by a particular enzyme, say an example of E1. This is enzyme E1, which catalyzes the conversion of S1 to S2. Likewise, S2 to S3 by enzyme E2. S3 to S4 by enzyme E3. And each enzyme is specified by a particular gene. Say an example, G1 is responsible for coding enzyme E1, G2 for E2, the enzyme, and G3, the gene for, that is enzyme A3. So this is what I represent the biosynthetic pathway. A stepwise conversion of one substance into another, leading to the formation of the final product. So in between we have a number of intermediate products. So each enzyme is specified according by a particular gene. And because of some changes in the gene, so what will happen, a particular enzyme will not be produced or a defective enzyme is formed so that the particular enzyme is unable to convert a particular substrate into another substrate for example let us take the gene G2 it undergoes modification spot change or mutation so that the dominant gene gets converted into a recessive gene G2 and as a result what will happen this E2 enzyme will not be formed or we have received a defective enzyme E2 that defective enzyme has no ability of converting this S2 into S3. So that what will happen is S2 accumulates in the body. And this phenomenon is called metabolic block. A particular substrate accumulates in the body because of the absence of particular enzyme or because of the presence of a defective enzyme and due to mutation for a particular gene which calls for the enzyme. So, this is what we represent as what is called the inborn error of metabolism. So, it is right from the birth, that is what is called inborn error. And almost all disorders in the body is because of actually inborn error of metabolism, as proposed by one scientist by name Garrod. So, most of the recessive gene disorders, what we have in the body because of mutation, uh, because of inborn error of metabolism as proposed by Kara. So, he wrote one book by name Inborn Error of Metabolism. Inborn Error of Metabolism. So, he is also aptly called Father of Biochemical Genetics. He is aptly called Father of Biochemical Genetics because the one who described the metabolic pathway, that is what is happening during that process within the metabolic block because of uh, the production of a defective enzyme or absence of an enzyme due to mutation in a particular gene that is being transmitted from the parents to the offspring during the course of reproduction. So this is what we call metabolic block. Now let's see what are the different types of disorders caused. Now we can classify the genetic disorders under two categories. One, Mendelian disorders. Another one, chromosomal disorders. So, when you are talking about Mendelian disorders, it is caused by a single gene, a defect in a single gene, and that is the cause for the development of a disease. 
a single gene disorder. We can also say unifactorial disorder. Unifactorial disorder caused by a single gene. So due to mutation or alteration of a single gene. So that what will happen in a particular phenotype in the form of enzyme will not be produced. Resulting in the development of a particular disorder. Then the second one, chromosomal disorders. It may be because of changes in the number of chromosomes or maybe breakage and loss of chromosomes, particular chromosome, either deletion or addition, etc. So anyway, we can have a disorders caused by a single gene and disorders caused by the entire chromosome due to change in the number or due to breakage and loss of a particular part of the chromosome that is called the chromosomal disorders. Then, so I mentioned already, when you take about these Mendeley disorders, almost it is actually what we what we can say monogenic inheritance. Mendelian inheritance is also called monogenic inheritance. We have seen all the day. So in a monogenic inheritance, one gene, one character. It is also called as a qualitative inheritance. So if there is any mutation in a particular gene or alteration in a single gene, then we have the disorder. That is what we can say the monogenic inheritance disorder or unifactorial gene disorder, or unifactorial disorders because it is caused by a single factor or single gene. A mutation, a sudden change or deletion or addition in a base, whatever may be the case we have. So alteration in the DNA occurs leading to what we have the development of disorders. So such disorders are called Mendelian disorders or unifactorial disorders. Now, actually, I mentioned already just the genetic disorder types. The first one, Mendelian disorders. And normally they follow simple monogenic inheritance. Simple monogenic inheritance. That means one gene, one character. If there is any change in that particular gene, what will happen, the phenotype of an individual will be affected according to the nature of the dominancy or recessiveness as the case may be. So we have some sort of disorders, dominant gene disorder or recessive gene disorder. So anyway, any change in a particular gene will affect the phenotype and that is being transmitted to the next generation and that is called simple monogenic inheritance method. Now, if you want to analyze the nature of such inheritance, we always see naturally the method adapted, what we have is pedigree analysis. So the pedigree analysis of the family chart, the family tree helps us to follow the course of such genetic disorders, particularly for example the recessive gene disorders, autosomal recessive gene disorders or autosomal dominant gene disorders, how far the characters have been descended from just our ancestors to us and also the future generation like that we can conclude what is the course of such genetic disorders that can be analyzed with the help of pedigree analysis. Now let's take the first category, Mendelian or unifactorial disorders. Disorder caused by a change in a single gene. That's why it's called as unifactorial disorder. So you know that part, it is depending on the quality of the gene. It is depending on the quality of the gene. So that is why it's also called qualitative inheritance, a Mendelian inheritance. Now, some disorders are caused by genes which is recessive, formed in the autosomes. So, Recessive autosomal gene disorder. The second one, some genes you know that one it is expressed as its character as a dominant character. A gene which is dominant, it undergoes some change, it causes some disorders. And that is called dominant autosomal gene disorder. And both are formed in the autosomes, the body chromosomes. Suppose you are taking human beings, we have 44 autosomes. In these 44 autosomes, we have some of the genes are recessive, some of the genes are dominant. When there is any fluctuation, any alteration in that particular gene that resulted in the development of a particular disease, that means that disease caused by a recessive gene present in the autosomes. The second one, uh, uh, disease caused by a dominant gene present in the autosomes because of some changes in the gene. And also we have recessive sex linked characters. In the last class we have seen this among the characters caused by recessive gene formed in one of the sex chromosomes, mostly the X chromosomes. So, let's see for example color blindness, hemophilia, etc. Now, what is the difference between these two? So, normally the case of recessive sex linked characters, you know that one, it follows crisscross pattern of inheritance. 
or zigzag inheritance as second generation. That means the characters are inherited to the second generation through the caries of first generation. But in the case of autosomal recessive or dominant in disorders, it is not so. There is no skip generation. And normally the characters are expressed directly. There is no skip generation. Either we have the dominant character or the recessive character. So normally the recessive autosomal gene disorders occur when the recessive genes are brought together. When they are formed in homozygous condition, they are highly effective. They are highly lethal. So they exhibit lethality. The death of the individual occurs when the recessive genes are formed together. When compared to this dominant autosomal gene disorders, they are somehow better when compared to that one. So anyway, in almost all cases, when the recessive genes are brought together, then we have the lethality, the death of the individual. So, in the case of this one, so there is direct inheritance for autosomal gene disorders. But here there is no direct inheritance. You know that one, the characters are being inherited to the second generation through the caries of first generation. The first generation may be a male individual or female individual because the genes for these characters are localized in the X chromosome. Let's see, we already seen about this extremely characters, hemophilia, color blindness. So I don't want to touch this one, the third one. Let's go further about the unifactory disorders related to the autosomal genes, either dominant or recessive. Now the first one, recessive autosomal gene disorder. So we have a number of disorders. And what I mentioned already, this is because of metabolic pathway block, or simply we can say metabolic block. The concept one gene, one enzyme concert. That means one step is catalyzed by a particular enzyme. That enzyme is normally coded by a particular gene. That concept is called one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. As proposed by Bedel and Tant, they propose this concept that is namely one gene, one enzyme hypothesis for a represented S1 to S2, S2 to S3. And also the enzyme D1, E2, E3, etc. And the genes D1, G2, D3, etc. So all these things are actually together cause one G, one enzyme hypothesis proposed by Bale and Tant. Bale and Tant propose the concept of one G, one enzyme hypothesis. So a single G produces a particular enzyme, that enzyme catalyzes a particular, what is called, that is a, a step. And this is what is called one gene, one enzyme hypothesis proposed by Bedel and Tatum. They conducted the experiment in the case of red mold, neurospora. Neurospora. They conducted the experiment in the case of neurospora, Bedel and Tatum. That is normally called red mold. In order to support what is called the biochemical evidence of uh, the concept of one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. But it has been later modified, you know, that one, one gene, one polypeptide hypothesis. Now let's see, let's take most of the recessive gene disorders follow this concept namely one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. I will show you. Now, this is number one, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia. So now in the case of these persons, affected persons, you know that one actually, the RBC is a biconcave and disc shape. Biconcave and disc shape. But in the case of affected people, the RBCs become sickle shaped like this. The RBCs become sickle shaped under low oxygen tension. So the affected hemoglobin molecule undergoes polymerization during low tension of oxygen in the blood. So that this biconcave shaped structure gets converted into sickle cell shaped structure. That is why it's called sickle cell anemia. And also because reduction in the number of RBCs. The person suffers from anemic condition. You know that one decreased number of RBC or decreased amount of hemoglobin or both is called what is known as anemic condition. And along with the shape of the cell, sickle cell, that is why the name is given as sickle cell anemia. Now, actually, you have normal hemoglobin. If you are taking it just normally, in the case of individuals, we have hemoglobin, normal hemoglobin. So this is a conjugated protein. This hemoglobin is formed of a compound heme plus globin. Plus globin. Now the globin is a protein part. The globin is a actually protein part. 
And the skin is a kind of pot firing ring. Pot firing ring compound. Pot firing ring compound. So we can say iron containing pot firing ring compound. So this is a non protein pot having iron in it responsible for the transport of oxygen. So there is actually one molecule of aglutinin transports, transports four molecules of oxygen because in each limb there are four ion atoms. Now let's leave this one. Let's go for globin. So this globin is actually formed of normally four chains. So in the case of adult hemoglobin, it's being represented as HDA. This is what we call this one adult hemoglobin. So in the case of adult hemoglobin, the globin part is formed of two alpha chains and two beta chains. The alpha chain, each chain is formed of 146 amino acids. This beta chain, each is formed of 147. So all together, as we have four, the total number of amino acids is 186. So, but in the case of sickle cell anemia, out of 586, one amino acid has been changed. In a particular case, one type of amino acid has been changed. That results in the death of the individual. You see that one, out of 586, only one amino acid has been replaced or substituted by another. Now, in addition to this one, so normally we have alpha globin, beta globin, and also we have another type of globin, what we call this one delta globin. So delta globin, nearly 3% of the adult population, 3% of the adult population have just a delta globin part. So alpha globin having alpha chains, beta globin having beta chains, this delta chain has slight variation only between this delta and beta. So we have three different types. But this is a rare one, that is what is called the delta chain, it is a rare one, about 3% of the people are on effect. Now, so in the case of uh, this what sickle cell anemia, now we have the gene. So the normal gene actually for this disorder, so we have the genotype, for example, I am taking this is a gene, a normal hemoglobin. So when this gene undergoes mutation, we have formed a recessive allele, namely just HBS, small disease. Now this one is responsible for causing the disease. When a person is having a recessive gene, but not in heterosexual escalation, but in homozygous escalation, it leads to lethality. So accordingly, we have three different types of genotypes. So an example, HBE, this is one type of genotype, a normal hemoglobin. So another one forms a normal hemoglobin, but actually a carrier. So this is HBE, we are denoting the normal hemoglobin. And this is nothing but again a carrier person, but not, not affected. So having one dominant gene, one recessive gene. The last person actually having sickle cell hemoglobin. I am using the capital letter for sickle cell hemoglobin. And the G small letter. So we have say, three different groups of people. One is homozygous dominant normal. Another one is heterozygous dominant but normal but carrier. The third one sickle cell hemoglobin having two recessive genes. So when these two recessive genes are brought together, that result in the death of the individual or causing the disorder what we call the sickle cell anemia. So in almost all the recessive gene disorder, when the recessive gene is brought together, then it results in the death of the individual or causing lethality. That is why just and the doctors always say not to have marriage between close relatives. The reason for that one, so they have the same gene pool. So there is a possibility of bringing together of recessive genes all together so that the individual may have some problems either mentally affected or some sort of problems even the death also. So, as we have three different groups of people based on the hemoglobin and also this one, the hemoglobin sickle cell anemia is also an example for polymorphism. Sickle cell anemia is also considered as an example for polymorphism. You know the meaning for polymorphism, the occurrence of more than just one phenotype. Here there are three different phenotypes, normal, normal carrier and then sickle cell. 
That is where we can see triple single cell anemia is an example for polymorphism. Now this is one. Now what is the reason, what is the actual cause for the development of the disorder? This is because of the mutation. Because of the mutation of this what is called the gene responsible for particular. Particular amino acid. So you know that one we have codons. There are 64 codons out of the 64 codons, 61 codons are specifying amino acids. Each one specifies an amino acid. Now, when there is a change in the codon because of a mutation in a particular gene, what will happen? The expression is also changed. And that results in the development of the disorder. So I mentioned earlier, heterozygous individuals appear apparently unaffected. But they are carried for the disease. But they are carried for the disease. And but they have an adaptation. So people with normal hemoglobin, actually they are not resistant to malarial disease. But people who are carried for this gene, and the people who are carried for the sickle cell gene, they are highly resistant to malaria. They are not affected with the malaria. So the normal people may be affected by malaria. They are not resistant. They are susceptible to malaria. Whereas the heterozygous individuals are actually just resistant to malaria. This is because of actually the natural selection phenomenon studied later. Now, so it can be transmitted from the parents to offspring when both the parents are carrier. So if one parent is having a recessive gene, for example, homozygous recessive gene, another one a dominant. So we have received only the carrier. We have received only the carrier. Now, in the case of almost all the recessive gene disorders, if marriage occurs between two carriers, then in the next generation, 25% of the children affect, and 50% of the people are carriers, and only 25% dominant not affect. This is the probability when marriage occurs between two carriers, but not affected people. The probability of the children regarding the disorder, 25% of the children are affected and then 50% of the people are normally carriers and only 25% of the people who are dominant are not completely affected. We will see the illustration later. Now what is the reason for that? So normally the sickle cell anime is an example for substitution mutation or a missense mutation. Sickle cell anemia is an example for missense mutation or substitution mutation. Substitution mutation. So what do you mean by missense mutation or substitution? So in the case of missense or substitution mutation, a particular base, a nitrogenous base in the nucleotide in a DNA molecule has been replaced or substituted by another base. For example, I am taking one code or just I am taking the G, GAG. So in the gene, suppose instead of GAG, if you have GTG, you see that what A has been replaced in that base, T has been substituted. And this is what we can say that is substitution mutation or missense mutation. So as a result of the substitution of one base, what will happen? The amino acid expression is also has been changed. Now this GAG is a G for the formation of one amino acid namely glutamic acid. It is coding for glutamic acid. This genetic code in a particular DNA molecule GAG is responsible for the coding of glutamic acid through the codon. The codon for this one is also called GAG. And once the gene has been substituted by another base, then what will happen? The glutamic acid has been replaced by the line. So it is an example for point mutation. Sickle cell anemia is an example for point mutation because mutation occurs at a particular point that is in a particular gene. That's why it's called a particular gene or particular point. That's why it's called point mutation. So point mutation is also called as gene mutation. So a single base A has been replaced or substituted by T that is thymine that resulted in the expression of the phenotype. 
So, if the globin molecule in a particular place, instead of glutamic acid, we have received the lime that causes what we call the sickle cell anemia. So, GAT has been transformed into GTG, simple gene mutation. So, anyway, sickle cell anemia is examined for point mutation or missense mutation and substitution. In missense mutation, a base or an amino acid has been substituted, resulting in the change of the phenotype. That is called missense or substitution mutation. Now, let's see the expression just in the chart. Now, the substitution actually, the amino acid normally we have the reason for the one. So, the defect is caused by the substitution of glutamic acid. That is at the sixth position of the beta globin chain of the hemoglobin molecule. The defect is caused by the substitution of glutamic acid by berline. So, in place of glutamic acid, it has been replaced by berline. At peptide number 6, the 6th amino acid in beta chain. So, the 6th amino acid in beta chain in a normal hemoglobin is glutamic acid. But in the case of affected person sickle cell hemoglobin, it is being substituted or replaced by the line. That is the cause for sickle cell anemia. This is the what is called the biochemical analysis. Now, what is the actually the genetical cause? So, how this glutamic acid has been replaced with the line? This is because of the change in the codon that to the change in that is the gene cause. So, now, what is the reason for the substitution of this amino acid? So, the substitution of the amino acid is due to the single base substitution at the sixth position of the globin gene. So, I mentioned just we have this is a codon. So, normally you know that when the codon is carried by the mRNA. Now, the GAG is a codon for the amino acid glutamic acid. And this GAG has been transformed into another codon GUD. You see that when a single base has been replaced. That causes much effect. So, it is being converted into the line. Glutamic acid has been transformed as substituted by the line. So, this is a codon for glutamic acid and this is a codon for the line. Then, normally, the G for this codon, for the so these are all actually the codons carried by the MR. And for the transcription of these codons, we need the genetic code in the DNA model. Now, the gene for the formation of this codon is actually just we have GAGG. You will see in the DNA molecule. So, in the DNA molecule, we have two strands. One strand is called what is known as sense strand or coding strand. Another one is called anti sense strand or non coding strand. So, the sense strand is the one which carries a message. So, the another strand normally which is acting as a template for transcription process carries normally just not the true one, but actually having the complicated basis to those of the genes lo localized in the sense strand. So, what we have, let's see in the picture. So, what is happening? Now, this is a normal gene. So, this is a DNA molecule. Now, this is what is called the sense strand and the sense strand. So, this is sense having the original gene GH. And this strand is not acting as a template, you know that one. If this strand is acting as a template, it cannot have the codon or second the GAG anymore. So, GAG the G. Now, this is actually, this is the coding G and this is what is called a codon. So, a codon is nothing but you know that one, a triplet code. Consisting of a set of three nucleotides which is specific amino acid which is being transcribed by the DNA. This is a codon and this is a code. The genetic code. So, this is the original gene. It has been transcribed in mRNA. Then when it is being translated, you know in a protein synthesis we have two events. One, what we call the transcription process. Another one, transcription process. Now, this part is the transcription. The message in the DNA molecule has been transcribed in mRNA as a codon. Now, this is the original gene. The DNA having the original gene is called the sense strand. The G, another strand, a complementary strand which is acting as a template is called as an sense strand. It is acting as a template. Now, the message in the template strand has been transcribed. So, that we are getting the same message as in the sense strand. So, GAG is the codon now. And this one, 
we translate it from the glutamic acid. So it is happening at peptide number 6 or the 6 amino acid. Now what will happen? So here what will happen in this case? So during mutation, now in DNA molecule in the cell strand, the A has been normally substituted. So we have no just actually U, this is the wrong one. So GAT and here we have it, it has been transformed into T. So in DNA molecule there is no U, so it just uh, you make a correction on that one. So GTG, that is a G. So A has been substituted by T. A has been substituted by time. Now as a result, what happened? In the complement strand, we have CAG instead of CTC. Now these triplet bases have been translated to form GUT instead of GUT. Now if you have the pole on GAT, then only we have the amino acid glutamic acid. If the pole has been trans actually transformed or has been changed because of the mutation instead of GH and GT we have just with the light. As a result in the sixth position in beta chain instead of glutamic acid we have the line that results in the formation of sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is an example for point mutation. Number two, sickle cell anemia is also an example for missense mutation. So it is also an example for substitution mutation. Don't forget these three points. Missense mutation or that is specifically generally point mutation. Also we can say substitution mutation. A base has been substituted by another base. It is bother about either it is transition or transversion. So in the case of sickle cell, we don't have U in the DNA molecule. We have only T. So this is GTG not G. So we have to make a change. Okay now, so that is the main cause for the development of uh, that is the disorder sickle cell anemia. So in the case of sickle cell anemia, what will happen? The death occurs because the blood vessels are being blocked due to the sickle cell shaped structures and also particularly in the heart, in the kidney or in the liver. In all these places we have the clogged blood vessels, obstructed blood vessels, blood vessels in the death of the individual. So anyway, the carriers, the sickle cell people, the carriers are normally acting as carriers, they don't have the disease. So it is being transmitted only when both the parents are carriers. Now you see that one here, this is the sickle cell hemoglobin and this is the normal hemoglobin. Not all the hemoglobin, actually here it's a mixture of all bases. Sir. Some forms are by concrete, some forms are actually the sickle cell. So both the normal red blood cells and sickle cell cells are present in this one. Just to show that one, what is the difference between sickle cell and then that is the normal cells. Normal cells are by concave and viscous shape and that one these cells are normal sickle shape. Now let's see the inheritance. I mentioned already. See that one, both are carriers. So I am taking just gene. Let us assume capital S1. Now, if both are carriers, so it follows, I mentioned already, simple monogenic inheritance, there is no, what is called, skip generation, is being transmitted directly. Now, as the result, you see that one, we have received in monohydrate class 3 to 1 ratio, it is not a sex linked disorder. Now, 50% of the people are carriers, 50% of the people are carriers, you see that one, 50% of the children, the violet colored one, carriers. And the 25% are not affected. 25% are not affected. And 25% of the people are affected. So it is not only for this disorder, namely sickle cell anemia, also for a medicine, place science, disease, or catanuria. We have so many disorders. All recessive gene disorders, autosomal disorders, they form a simple monogenic inheritance. And that the disorder has been transmitted in both the parents are carried. So it is actually a typical genotypic ratio of what we are receiving in a monohydrate cross. If a cross is affected by the heterozygous individual sub F1, we will get you know that one. So one uh, dominant, one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous dominant, and one homozygous recessive. That too the recessive individuals are affected. So the effect is there only when the recessive genes are brought together. So if actually both are carriers, there is always 25 percent chance of the disease in the case of child and 50 percent of the offsprings have that is heterozygous condition acting as carriers the same one for all the diseases like thalassemia also albinism 
taste like species and another disorder is polyploid C. Now the second disorder, phenylketonemia or Follin's disease under the name of the doctor. So it is also a, a recessive autosomal disorder. Recessive, it is also a recessive autosomal trait. It is also an example for one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Now here the disorder happens to occur because of the metabolism of one amino acid, namely phenylalanine. So in the case of this disorder, we have phenylalanine, one amino acid. So it has a number of pathways. Let us assume this is S1. It is being converted into just what we call this one tyrosine. Converted tyrosine or some other process. So, here this breakdown, normally the breakdown of phenylalanine occurs mostly with the protein circuit in the liver where you have one just enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. When this enzyme E1 is absent, what will happen? This step is not taking place. So that the phenylalanine accumulates in the blood. It is also gets converted to phenylpyruvic acid and also we have a number of ketone bodies. When this phenylalanine accumulates in the blood, it is being excreted in the urea. That is why it is called phenylketone urea. You have the pedigree of phenylketone urea also. It is also form as what is called simple methamine inheritance. Here also we have the carries of the transmitters. So, in the case of this disorder, we have a number of symptoms. For example, hypopigmentation of the skin excretion of phenylalanine in the urine. So, I repeat once again. So, the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase is absent. That converts this amino acid phenylalanine into tyrosine and that is why the phenylalanine accumulates in the blood and also gets converted into just base of pyruvic acid product that is phenylpyruvic acid and other derivatives. Now, as the result it is being excreted in the urine that is why the result is called phenylketone urea and also we have eczemia condition or eczema condition that is the itchy skin. The mental retardation, hypopigmentation of the body, the pigmentation has been decreased and also the persons show mossy water, the smell like a asthma on the surface of the body. So itchy skin, mental retardation, increased phenylalanine in the blood hypopigmentation of the skin. These are some of the disorders, actually, sorry, the disease symptoms associated with phenylalanine. Now, let's proceed further. Now, here is the cause. So, the main effect here, you see that word mental, mental retardation. Now, in the case of the child here, it shows, he is mentally retarded and doesn't know anything about it. Even, you see that one is just unable to hold the liquid food. The picture shows that one. A person, a boy with untreated PKU, phenylketone urea. Now the next one, alcatan urea. Now the alcatan is a trade name for one acid, what is called homogenesic acid. Homogenesic acid is normally known as what is called alcatan. And now here also one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. We have a pathway. So the same phenylalanine gets converted to phenylpyruvic acid. So the phenylpyruvic acid only converted to just what is called tyrosine in another part. So it is being converted into one acid, what is called homogenesic acid. And this one is being broken with the help of enzyme homogenesic acid oxidase. When the enzyme is present, the normal pathway is taking place properly. When the particular enzyme is absent, what will happen? There is no conversion of this acid, homogenesic acid, into this what is called malic acetoacetic acid. So that what will happen? This acid accumulates in the blood. It is excreted along with urine. On exposure to atmosphere, this acid undergoes oxidation so that it turns black in color, causing the urine turning black. That is why the disorder is also called black urine disease. Alcantar urea. Alcatan is present, alcatan oxides are connected, the phenyl aluminum oxides are formed in the form of alcatan. When it, when it is exposed to the atmosphere, it ultimately turns black, causing the urine also turning into black color, leading to black urine disease. We have also another disorder, we know that one black water fever. 
that black water fever is not a genetic disorder. It is a protozoa disease caused by you know that one plasmodium falciparum. They are also the urine turns black in color, but along with the fever, and that is not a genetic disorder caused by a plasmodium species, plasmodium falciparum. Now we see the pathway of this metabolism of this phenethylamine. I mentioned already. Now the actually I mentioned the person by name Garrod. He discovered alkaptan urea as in one error of metabolism, in one metabolic error. So the symptoms are increased expression of alkaptan. And dark coloration of skin and eyes. I show one picture where you have the pigmentation, dark pigmentation the skin of the eye. So dark coloration of skin and eyes. Now let's see the pathway for this pigment alanine to cause the disease. So this is actually a uh, picture shows dark pigmentation in the sclera. So dark pigmentation of the skin and also just we have the sclera hyperstructure. This is because of uh, the disorder alkaptan urea along with the excretion of more alkaptan in the blood leading to the black color of the urea. Now this is a pathway. So what is the reason how far this alkaptan urea this is developed? Now this is amino acid. Now I am taking this is S1. And this, it is being converted to S2 by means of an enzyme actually phenyl alanine hydroxylase. So it is being converted to hydroxyphenyl pyruvic acid. The next step only homogeneous acid. So it is being converted into malic acid acid acid. Then later you have the fibril acid acetic acid etc. So this is another pathway in this bar for this one. So this is S2 and S3 and this one S4. And it is being converted, it is being this to be converted into S1. But this step is not taking place because of the absence of the enzyme HGAO, homogenesic acid oxidase. Homogenesic acid oxidase. So that what will happen? There is no conversion of S4 into S1. Now this acid accumulates in the blood, then it is excreted along the urine, then it turns, it makes the urine turns black in color, and that is why it's called black urine disease. So this is the pathway, just go through that one, how far the disease will develop because of the metabolic block at this level. For the disorder albinus, that is white colored skin. So this is because of the absence of melanin pigment. The same biosynthetic pathway but little bit bifurcation. So once again we are taking this phenyl albinus. It is being converted into another amino acid what is called tyrose. And this is being converted to form dopa and it is being converted to form melanin. This is the normal pathway. Now the phenylalanine, we have the phenylhydroxylase. Now this tyrosin gets converted to dopa and with the help of an enzyme, tyrosinase enzyme, the enzyme that is responsible for this process called tyrosinase enzyme. And this enzyme is another control of a particular gene. When the gene is undergoing mutation or undergoing mutation, then there is no tyrosinase enzyme being produced or we have some defective enzyme is formed and that is normally responsible for the conversion of this dopa into melanin. The dark pigmentation of the skin responsible for skin complexity and skin coloration. That is why we have the person lacking the pigment, he becomes white or albino. So it is also an example for one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. This is because of the recessive gene. So dihydroxyphenyl alanine, dopa, and that one gets converted to melanin. And normally all these reactions are happening in the melanocyte, the place where the melanin pigment is formed in the skin epidermis. The cell name is melanocyte. Once formed, the melanin is being stored in another cell in the form of granules, what is called melanophore cells. So melanocyte and melanin. Now what are the symptoms? I mentioned there is a lack of pigmentation. So we have milk white colored skin. Unlike other people, I show the figure also. And absence of melanin in three places mainly. That is we have in the skin, in the hair and our spines. And also just in the adrenal gland, in the adrenal medulla. See in the eyes we have in the choroid coat, we have this pigment. The middle choroid coat, the pigmented layer responsible for the absorption of extra light and also preventing the reflection of light rays, and that is the choroid coat having the pigmentation. So, if this pigment is absent, ultimately the person is unable to see the light directly. That's why he has a disorder, what's called marked photophobia. 
highly sensitive to light. This is because of the absence of pigment in the choroid core, so that the person is unable to just absorb the extra light. So the eye illumination making him just to close his eyes is always closing his eyes partially. Cannot see the object directly. That is actually the sunlight. Now there are three types of actually illumination. This is based on the nature of the parts affected. If all the three parts are affected, skin, hair and eyes, then it is called generalized albinus. And if only two parts are affected, for example, the skin and hair, leaving the eyes, then it is called partial albinus. And it is just if we have the eyes alone affected, the person is only photophobic, this is because of the absence of pigment in the right coat, then it is called localized albinism or ocular albinism. Localized albinism or ocular albinism. Actually, the incidence is also one in uh, that's 5,002, one in 25,000 people. Just to be have the incidence of frequency, one in 5,002, one in 25,000 people are affected by this disorder. So it also follows the same pattern of inheritance. Here is a person, you see that one. See, the skin color is white. This is called milk white color skin. Even the hair is also white in color. And you see that one, the eyes are partially closed. So it is not completely open. The reason for that one, it cannot see the sunlight directly. That is the reason, a child with albinism. So this is the example of what we have another resistive disorder. Now this is number 5, you have tay sachs disease. It is also called gangliosidosis. Gangliosidosis. And normally, one um, galactolipid mark, one galactolipid, just what we call this one, ceramide. Ceramide is a galactolipid. Or we can say what is called gangliosid. Pan gangliosine. It is a kind of spingomide. A kind of spingomide. So ceramide, a branded lipid molecule, it is having a sugar side chain. That's why it's called as galactolipid. So it is also called as gangliosine. And that's why the disorder is called gangliosidosis. So the ceramide is also called gangliosine. Gangliosine and some problem arises in the metabolism of the gangliosine or ceramide. So this one is a branded lipid molecule having side chain in the form of sugar. And for the removal of sugar, we need an enzyme what is called beta DN acetyl hexosaminidase. So it is an example of hexosamine. You see that one, that is gangliosine is an example for hexosamine. So that we need for the metabolism of the sugar side chain an enzyme beta DN acetyl hexosaminidase. When this enzyme is absent, there is no breakdown of the ceramide. The ceramide is highly toxic when it accumulates in them, that is, in the body. Particularly, it accumulates in the brain cells. So, the gangliosine, it is normally accumulates in the brain cell. When it is accumulating more than the normal level, it causes mental retardation. And also, paralysis occurs in the child, and the child dies even before the age of 4 or 5 because of the accumulation of ceramic in the brain and that leads to toxicity and leads to what is called mental retardation and paralysis of the child occurs and the child dies even before the age of 4 or 5. So mental retardation due to damage in the brain and spinal cord, gradual paralysis and leads to death by age 4 or 5. Now the next one thalassemia. So it is also called police anemia. It is also inherited as an autosomal recessive gene disorder. Autosomal recessive gene. Now what is the reason for thalassemia? It may be because of the mutation and deletion of a gene that is responsible for the synthesis of globin part of the hemoglobin. So the gene responsible for the synthesis of hemoglobin, that's a globin part, if it undergoes mutation or it is being deleted from that actual part because of the deletion. It results in reduced rate of synthesis of the globin. The globin is normally not properly synthesized. We have two chains, alpha and beta chains. Now this is the alpha chain and this is the beta chain. So there is a reduction in synthesis of actually globin chains, either alpha or beta chains that make up the hemoglobin molecule. As a result, we have abnormal synthesis of hemoglobin. Abnormal synthesis here nothing but reduction in the amount of hemoglobin that results in the disease. So there is a quantitative problem. So unlike the sickle cell enema, there is a qualitative problem, but it is a quantitative problem. The amount of globin synthesis has been reduced because of either deletion or mutation or both. 
Now, there are two types of thalassemia. Type 1, alpha thalassemia. Alpha thalassemia. So here again the production of hemoglobin, there is also the globin chain. What is called the alpha globin chain is affected. Alpha globin chain is a symbol for alpha. So alpha globin chain is affected. Now, what are the genes responsible for controlling the synthesis of uh, alpha globin? Normally, there are two closely linked genes, namely HBA1 and HBA2. These are the two genes. Localized in chromosome number 16 of each parent. So, in each parent, we have two genes, so that we have already the four genes coming from. Actually, two parents brought together. So, it is controlled, the synthesis is controlled by two genes, namely HBA1 and HBA2 on chromosome 16 of each pair. Now, what will happen for this alpha, what, what is the reason for alpha thalassemia? If any one of these genes are deleted and mutated, so it is due to mutation and deletion of one or more of the four genes, because from each pair two, so maybe deletion one gene or more than one gene of the four genes. And that results in what is called alpha thalassemia. So the more the genes deleted or affected or mutated and less will be the amount of globin synthesis namely alpha globin. Then the next one beta thalassemia. So this is beta thalassemia. So it is actually the production of beta globin is controlled by a single gene just what we call this one HBB. That is located at cross number 11 and that one is cross number 16. And for this alpha globin, we have this is the beta globin. The gene for that one is it will not replace the same chromosome, a different chromosome of 11, that is namely HBB. And that one is where it is undergoing mutation. So when one or both the genes, because we have two genes, one from each parent, so if there are two genes. So when one or both the genes are affected, so here it is because of the main mutation, not because of the actual deletion. There in the case of alpha thalassemia, it may be because of mutation and deletion, but here it is because of mutation of one or both the genes. Then we have the problem what is called beta thalassemia. And also I mentioned what have the delta thalassemia. The delta thalassemia is also similar to beta thalassemia, the same effect actually, and also just happening in the beta gene, sorry, the delta gene. Now, I mentioned earlier, if you want to make a difference between thalassemia and then what is called sickle cell anemia, you see that one, thalassemia and sickle cell anemia, as I mentioned earlier. So, thalassemia is a quantitative problem of synthesis in only two few globin molecules. I mentioned already when there is mutation or deletion of the gene, what will happen? There is a reduced synthesis of globin of either alpha chain or beta chain, or alpha globin or beta globin. So, it is a qualitative problem, just a concern with what a change in the amount. But whereas the sickle cell anemia is a qualitative problem, we have seen we know that one. So, there is no reduction in the number of amino acids, only that we have 586 amino acids I mentioned. So, the amino acid has been substituted, there is no change in the number of amino acids of all the four chains. Even in the case of beta chain, we have 147, there is no reduction, there is no change in the number. The same 147 being formed. But normally we have just a substitution. That's why it is a qualitative problem of synthesizing actually incorrectly functioning protein. A protein being formed, but it is not a correct one. It is functioning incorrectly. So it is a qualitative problem of synthesizing incorrectly functioning actually globin on protein, whereas the previous one, a quantitative problem, a reduction in the amount of globin happens. So there is a main difference actually between these two anemic conditions. Now cystic fibrosis. It is also called mucoviscidosis. That, that means the mucus accumulates more and more because of this condition cystic fibrosis. So normally we have the mucus layer forming a mechanical buffer lining the wall, the alimentary canal, the lungs, also the respiratory tract. In the case of pancreas, here and there we have the organs become a mucus layer. But sometimes the mucus becomes more viscous, then it results in mucoviscidosis. It becomes more viscous, that is called cystic fibrosis, because it causes a fibrous growth in the pancreas. That is why it is called cystic fibrosis. So the main organs affected are nothing but the digestive system and the respiratory system. 
These are the two major organs that are particularly the pancreas and the lungs are affected. This is because of the over secretion of this mucus. And now the gene responsible for causing this disorder is localized in chromosome number 7 and that is called CFTR factor, chloride transport factor. The one concerned with the salt metabolism. So when this gene is affected, not only we have what is called the more viscous mucus is formed, but also fibrous growth in the pancreas. That's the main symptom, fibrous growth in the pancreas. The salt metabolism is affected. The sweat contains more salt. So these are all some of the symptoms related to cystic fibrosis. See, production of thick and in mucus, accumulates in lungs, pancreas and liver, fibrous growth in the pancreas. I mentioned also the salt metabolism is affected, more accumulation of sodium chloride in the sweat. Now galactosemia. It is also an example of a inherited as a recessive order some trait. And it is again because of the absence of particular enzyme and inborn error of metabolism, galactose 1,6-phosphate uridyl transferase. The enzyme responsible for the breakdown or the conversion of this body is called the galactose, the milk sugar. So, with the help of this enzyme, this galactose gets converted into galacto, galactono, galactono, lacto. And it is being converted into galactonate, galactonate. And that one enters in the pentose pathway. We have studied Dickens pathway, pentose phosphate pathway. And that is the pathway of this galactose. The galactose has been converted to galactino, lacto, and then it is converted to galactino, galactonate, and it enters in the pentose pathway. One of the products formed in the pentose pathway, you have this galactonate. And ultimately being actually oxidized as one of the assistant and another pathway along with what is what we have the pathway of glycolysis and Krebs cycle. This is called the Dickens form. So the choice is unable to just break down our galactose because of the absence of this galactose 1 6 phosphate uric transferase and which affects mainly the liver. That's why we have hepatomega enlargement of the liver and also tonics. Enlargement of the liver and also tonics. So, one more disorder, the recessive gene disorder we have. Now, see, severe combined immunodeficiency. So, severe combined immunodeficiency, this is because of what is called ADA deficiency, another enzyme, adenosine deaminase. This enzyme is involved in what is called purine metabolism. We have adenine and guanine in the nucleic acid, you know that from the nitrogenous basis they are being actually broken because of the purine metabolism. So the purine metabolism is affected because of the absence of this enzyme, adenosine deaminase. And what will happen when this enzyme is absent? Then one product accumulates in the body, that is deoxyadenosine triphosphate. When this one accumulates, what will happen? It reduces the activity of one enzyme, ribonucleotide reductase, ribonucleotide reductase. And this is the enzyme responsible for the normal proliferation of the lymphocytes, the one which produces lymphocytes, the one which produces antibody. So, because of the absence of this enzyme, this accumulates and this one reduces the activity of ribonucleotide reductase and which is essential for the normal proliferation of the lymphocytes, the one which produces normally the antibody. So, as a result, what will happen? There is no lymphocyte proliferation, there is no lymphocyte production, the one responsible for the antibody. The child is unable to resist against the infection. So, that the child should be enclosed in the a completely sterile bubble, a plastic bubble. Bubble means nothing but a small incubated where only one child is being kept, the one which is highly infected. Hence it is called bubble boy syndrome. The disorder is called bubble boy syndrome as the disorder actually the affected child is being placed inside a sterile bubble. So the disorder is called as a bubble boy syndrome and the affected chromosome the affected actually the gene is located in chromosome number 20. The affected 
gene is located in chromosome 20 and now in gene therapy the first disease which was treated which was started for treating this disorder in 1990 that is based on the gene therapy effect that is being normally there so the boy affected is double boy syndrome and the gene is located in chromosome 20 and one female child was treated in 1990 by using the gene therapy method and replacing the gene just to correct the disorder so there is a last one what we have regarding that recessive autosomal gene disorders and if you are having any question just like we are supposed to ask or post a question and here and there you have some sort of obstructions I will bear with this this is because of the technical problem so you are requested to ask any question or post it in uh, that is uh, in online you can answer it thank you of course as